Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Virginia Lee, Associate Editor at BioCentury, and I'm joined today by Simone Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief, Steve Usden, Washington Editor, Lauren Martz, Senior Editor. There's a new administration and a lot of ground to cover. Today, we'll start by looking at some of the successes and limitations of Operation Warp Speed, which has helped facilitate the rapid development of COVID-19 vaccines, but has faced greater challenges when it comes to vaccine administration and therapeutics development. Steve, you spoke with Monsef Slaoui about his time as Chief Scientific Advisor of Warp Speed. What did he have to say about what Warp Speed did well and what it could have done better? It was an exit interview, and we went over a lot of ground. The way I look at it is that the disappointment in the chaotic administration of vaccines in the U.S. and also in the slower than hoped for manufactured ramp up is rightfully getting a lot of attention. But what I did with months of slowing, and I think it's worth doing, is stepping back a moment and looking at what warp speed has accomplished and where we'd be without it. I think the failure of the Merck COVID vaccine program that was announced today, Sanofi's setback and problems interpreting the AstraZeneca clinical trial data all show how important the portfolio approach was. Three of the world's most experienced biopharma companies haven't gotten vaccines over the line. And I think Slowey and Warp Speed can take some credit for the fact that the mRNA vaccines did and did so unambiguously in record time. And it's especially true for the Moderna vaccine, which got a tremendous amount of assistance from Operation Warp Speed. If the Johnson vaccine data are good, and we'll know about that soon, that's also going to be another huge win for the public and for Warp Speed. Steve, Monsef Slowey's expertise is in vaccines, in developing them, probably in picking them. He clearly understood the science of the vaccines very deeply. He's not necessarily the person who's going to drive the strategy for how you get it into people's arms. And you and I have discussed this offline a bit. There were plenty of generals on, online for both. But Monsef did feel that was part of his brief, I understand. And his explanation was that they sent it to the states and that the states are supposed to administer the vaccine. Did you get any sense that there was really no plan about the distribution and that it was really thrown over the over the net and that wasn't what Operation Warp Speed wanted to do? Or That's an exaggeration. So yeah, I've seen the media where people have said, oh, there was no plan at all. That's not true. There was a plan. There were many plans. They weren't all good plans and they weren't all implemented well. Basically, Operation Warp Speed, like the entire Trump administration, took the position that they were going to shift off responsibility for a lot of the COVID response to the states and to municipalities and to other jurisdictions. They required all of the states and municipalities and jurisdictions to submit plans to Operation Warp Speed, which Operation Warp Speed reviewed. And then they were, and the federal government then was supposed to help the states and jurisdictions to implement these plans. You could argue that the whole notion that the responsibility should be decentralized was a mistake. I don't think that was something that was in Monsef Slawi's power to change. And then you could argue, and he conceded to me, that Operation Warp Speed did not do nearly enough to provide assistance to all the jurisdictions and to help them smoothly administer the vaccines. The point he made, it's a valid one, is that the federal government doesn't have the kind of detailed information that's needed to plan administration of vaccines on a granular basis, and it needed the states to do that. The question, I think, is should it have been a federal program with input from the states, or should it have been a state program with input from the federal government, which is what it was? And I think that was probably a a fundamental error. I think one thing I wanted to add is that the UK task force, when I spoke to Kate Bingham recently, she explained to me that the UK vaccine task force was only about procuring, deciding on the vaccines. And once they were delivered, it was the Department of Health that was going to be responsible for distributing them. I don't think there's anything wrong with creating an Operation Warp Speed as they did, name aside, for merging the two. But I can see that there are just different ways that you could go about this. Well, in in the United States, we we don't have a national health service. We have a very fragmented system. You couldn't just have the federal government accelerating the development of vaccines and then just throw them over the transom and say, here they are, guys. You had to have an organized approach to prioritizing, distributing, and administering the vaccines. And that's been a real failure. 
And warp speed also had a therapeutics arm, and there was a lot of focus on monoclonal antibodies as a treatment and bridge to mass vaccination early on, but these haven't played as big a role as expected. So what did he have to say about some of the lessons learned there that should be applied to future pandemics? So there are two sets of things they said that I found really interesting. One was he said that they rushed development of monoclonal antibodies for COVID, which is natural because they're dealing with responding to an emergency. But in the course of doing that, they jumped right to IV administration of large doses of monoclonal antibodies. And his point is that for a therapy that's going to be used on an outpatient basis, IV administration has got so many logistic hurdles that it's never going to be efficient. It's never going to get into anything like all of the people who could be helped. So he said that for future pandemics, and I would argue that this one isn't over, it's not too late for this one, a priority should be set for ensuring that monoclonal antibodies can be administered through sub-Q or IM injections. The other thing that he said that I found really interesting was that he criticized NIH's active master protocol trials and the clinical trial system in general in the United States, to the extent you can call it a system, and said that it hadn't done a good job of testing therapies. He said something which we've mentioned on this podcast quite a few times, which is there was a plethora of underpowered, poorly designed trials, which are never going to result in actionable data. The other thing that he said about the active trials, which are master protocol trials, and which in theory could be much more efficient, is that they were not and have not been implemented in an efficient manner. It took far too long to get them going in the first place. And once they were going, it took far too long to switch from one therapy to another, to add things into the, to the arm, something that should be done very quickly. So Lauren, that relates directly to the story that you wrote last week on master protocols for COVID therapies and why they haven't been as productive as expected. So what sort of solutions are people proposing to improve master protocol implementation? I think there are two levels of solutions to the problem. So at I guess there are actually two problems. So as Steve mentioned, the trials have just been very slow to start up and they've been very slow to recruit patients, even at the sites that are up and running. The solutions that the sponsors have come up with so far are things like using standard contracts, take it or leave it, offer it to a trial site, and there's no negotiations. They are either in or they're out. Everyone's using a single IRB and different trials are using different training protocols for the staff at the sites, because that's actually been something that really slows down the process because each trial has its own training requirements. So that may be training protocols or or using a a mobile unit to staff the different trials. I think long-term, it's the solutions are a lot more complicated. The issue is that these trials aren't being prioritized at the institutions where they're being run. So as Steve said, I think it's about 5% of the trials for COVID-19 are sufficiently powered. The fact that these trials are competing for patients and other resources, staff, things like that, and they're all being run from the major academic medical centers means that the patients just aren't getting into the right trials. There needs to be a way to prioritize these trials at the right institutions. There needs to be a way to encourage physicians and patients to participate in trials. That means making the endpoints simple and just making these as small of a burden as possible, I think. Making the endpoint simple is something that was stressed over and over again about why the UK's recovery trial was so successful. That has recruited over 30,000 people so far. It's at 177 at least sites in the UK, but it was at 175 sites within no time at all. And they say this because it's a single page, very simple for the staff, the health practitioners in those hospitals to adopt. And I think that in the US, this taps into a bigger theme that we'll also be following this year, which is the need to bring more community health practices into the clinical trial enterprise. The fact that right now it's so centralized really puts the new therapies in the hands of a very limited sector of the population and very often a more affluent sector. And broadening the clinical trial enterprise is important. And actually, I think one note I'd say is that Biden's plan, which Steve and I are wading through at the moment, Biden's plan actually has a lot of provision 
for using community health centers to distribute the vaccine, not necessarily for, for clinical trial enterprise, but I do think that if they can lay the tracks there, that could be very important going forward. I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's about making the trials much simpler. It's about getting them into the communities and the community settings and ultimately using technologies that make it possible to integrate clinical trials into routine clinical care. And I thought it was really interesting that Remap Cap or Remap COVID, which is the COVID arm of that trial, has been enrolling better than some of the other trials in the U.S. And they've actually, I think it's just one health system, but they've been embedded their protocol into the electronic medical system of some rural hospitals. So that's helped them decentralize a bit. That's easier said than done because it's very expensive. I do think, I mean, I have been hearing throughout that it's been very difficult to echoing what Steve said before that companies are saying it's difficult to get their compounds onto the active trials or to get feedback about them. And it's been a very clunky process. And that's sort of in a pandemic for the most urgent thing possible. So doing that outside of a pandemic for routine drug development really has a ways to go. I'd like to circle back to the Biden administration's COVID plan. Simone and Steve, I know you're still working through it. So what are some of the highlights and takeaways so far? For me, I just think there's a few things that are relevant for the biopharma industry. And I'm going to be looking within those to the future, to what things among those could actually, as I said before, lay the tracks. So there are four big highlights. One is testing. There's a lot of emphasis on testing and creating a national testing strategy, a national pandemic testing board. The other that we're going to go into in some depth is in therapeutics. There's a plan to do preclinical work, clinical work, specifically on antivirals against coronavirus and on broad spectrum antivirals. I think many of these are going to be small molecules. This is really pandemic preparedness. There's a huge effort within there on data collection to guide the response. And so I think it's going to be interesting to see how much of that actually gets done and how much we get to use data for other clinical trials or other diseases, let's say. And there's a health equity task force that really is going to have a strategy, as we just talked about, going into minority communities, also going into rural communities, going into areas to enable distribution all over the place. And I just don't see why a health equity task force would have a life after COVID. There are health equity disparities as we've written about. And if this task force, their goal is to enable health equity across the population, underrepresented minorities, I think that's an ongoing need. It's a very good plan. That's just a start. The question is, who's going to implement it? Where the funding is going to come from to implement it? And who's going to have that responsibility for ensuring that the different pieces of it actually happen? And that isn't actually spelled out in the plan. I think that's going to be an important part of it. That's right. And then some of this is going to be subject to Congress approving funding. Some of it, I think, Biden can pull together by himself. And I'm not sure what proportion of it is dependent on congressional action. One last thing I'd like to touch on today are the Biden administration's moves to undo some last minute actions by HHS under the Trump administration, including the regulatory sunset rule. Steve, can you give us some background on what that sunset rule would mean for the FDA and how the new administration's handling it so far? So the sunset rule is one of about a half a dozen midnight rules that the Trump administration, in particular, HHS Secretary Alex Azar, his uh, general counsel, Bob Chero, and chief of staff, Brian Harrison, imposed on HHS in particular on FDA that limit FDA's authority and prevent it from working efficiently. The sunset rule, on the face of it, it sounds like a sensible thing if you don't actually know how government works, which is to say that all rules should be reviewed within 10 years of their promulgation And if they're not reviewed and affirmatively renewed, then they sunset, they just go away. The problem is that there are tens of thousands of rules out there and businesses, patients, physicians, healthcare systems all depend on continuity. They all depend on these rules continuing unless there's a defined process for changing them. So if they all suddenly start disappearing, there's going to be chaos and it's going to have really serious adverse consequences on the ability to develop medicines, to run hospitals, to do all kinds of things. 
the process also of having to review all of these rules, it's a very onerous process. There's very bureaucratic procedures for reviewing regulations, and that would basically tie up all of FDA's legal staff and the regulatory staff for years doing this. The insiders who I've spoken with have basically said that the task would be staggering and that probably, honestly, a lot of FDA staff would just throw up their hands and quit rather than spend the rest of their lives reviewing old rules. The Biden administration, like every other administration in modern history, came in with an executive order freezing all of the rules that were imposed in the last couple of months of the outgoing administration. They're going to have to analyze them and determine which ones they want to keep, which ones they want to modify, which ones they want to throw out. It's not going to be an easy process. For example, this one was put in place as a formal final rule, which means that in order to get rid of it or to change it, they're going to have to go through a formal notice and rulemaking process that could take months. All right, that's all we have time for today. All of our podcasts are available at our website, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Music for all of our podcasts is provided by Kendall Square Orchestra, which connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. 